Sharon. Oh yeah, where do I look? <laughs> At the big round light there. I see you. You are sur Sharon. You are surrounded with light from my side. Of course, Mike, Gentry. You're surrounded by light. Mel, <laughs> you are surrounded by. Yes, Mel, we are praying for you, and we're with you, and we understand, just so you know our hearts. And Faf, you've always had a light shining around you. And Julie, everybody's surrounded by light, but my voice. <clears throat> they just now came on or off? <laughs> it's like... Okay. Hi, Amy and Celia. You're breaking my heart. <clears throat> Can we start? All right. My voice is going to be very low. And I really, I was even trying to talk on the phone to a brother in uh, um, Virginia. And we had to shut down our conversation because I, after talking, for just a little while, it just started disappearing. So, here we go. We are in um, Genesis 15, and there's a very good chance that tonight will be our last night in Genesis 15. And I know that you're excited because you get to have Hagar and Hish Ishmael next. I know that that's really where your hearts have been. You've been bored with this altar stuff. <laughs> so I'm going to, just to get us up to date since this is going to do that, I'm going to start at verse 4 as far as reading so that we can see that context again. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. We discussed it. God isn't wanting your outward life more than he's wanting the, the Christ that he put in you, the son that he put in you, to be your outward life. And if you believe that, then you would say, then the Christian life is nothing short of Christ in you. That's what you would say. And we would say, that's why Christ is the first word in Christian, <laughs> you know. And um, we wouldn't make it a religion, but it would be a life, you know. If he wanted it to be a religion, you tell me if this isn't true, he would have taught all that stuff and then left us and told us to carry this out. But he came into us. He came into us as life. So... Um, and we, we saw the uh, adamant view of the father toward his son, this shall not be the firstborn. This is not the heir. This is not the one that's going to not only lead the family, but we will be of that family of the firstborn by his nature but shall come forth out of thine own bowels uh, shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars, meaning count the stars, if thou be able to number them. And again, we reminded that we're not able to number the stars. We can't even see them all. And a lot of times we'll say, Oh, there's a star. What if that was a constellation? <laughs> you know, or a galaxy or something like that. And we'll go, Oh, there's one you know, one billion, trillion. Some of you know the, the guy who said that, sorry. <clears throat> and uh, if thou be able to number them, and he said unto him, so shall thy seed be. Okay. And he's saying that he is more vast than our ability to try to comprehend and number. And, and he's more vast not just not just in the universe 
That's a picture of how vast he is in the heart of the Father. How much, how, how the, 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 without number, the grandness and the glory and the love that he has for his son. In verse 7, and he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. Um, and, you know, Abraham didn't, didn't sit in the Ur of Chaldees and go, hey, I'm an explorer, not a uh, settler. I think I'm going to just go look around. No, oh, God spoke to him. God spoke to him. You know, and God speaks to us. And God speaks to us pertaining to his son. He brought him to that land so that his son could fill that. Yeah, it's like I said son and it went, <laughs> I'm telling you, the Lord, the Father wants the son. <laughs> wow. I didn't know we were going to get special effects with this. When we, when we read the part about the thunder, could you just hit something real loud, Bob? <clears throat> um, but he, he's not just calling us to the blessings of, quote unquote, the land. He's calling us to his son. And he's not gonna, he's not gonna bring, just like he's not gonna bring forth his son in Eliezer of Damascus, He's not going to bring forth his son in the Earl of Ur of Chaldees either. He's going to do it in his place. Well, I mean, the fullness of that truth is we're that place. Now, I mean, you know, I've shared this several times recently, but in John 15, when it talks about he is the vine, and then the father is the husband, and we talked about this. There's no mention of us in the first verse. There's only the mention of that which was and is and always will be, and we've been brought into that, and if we don't appreciate it and we just make ourselves, we just say, like, living here and pat our bodies and, and say that I'm a branch, but we're not a branch. We're his branch. We're his branch for manifestation of his life and his nature and his fruit. That's what we are. That's who we are. That's why we exist. God is saying, this is why I brought you. That's why I called you. When I called you, I didn't call you. You know, for example, I mean, even a calling here. Some of you know you were called to this place. He didn't call you here. To, to serve Jesus as in Christianity, he called you here that the son might be formed in you. Exactly the, the same thing with Abraham. Exact same thing. That's it. That's the, that's the fullness of the calling. Um, and so when, it's when Jesus says, you, he says, you are my branches. You are my branches. We just hear... There's this teaching about a vine, and there's this teaching about you are the branches, and usually what we hear is you are the branch. Um, and so there's a vine, and there's a branch, and there's a, but it's, our, our reading many times is so not intimate. It's so not with him in it. It's theological, yes, this is the truth, this is the truth, and this is the truth, and I accept your, I accept your theological viewpoint on this because you're the son of God. Well, he's not saying, I'm the son of God, therefore accept my viewpoint. He's saying, I have called you and made you. You are my branches. You're, you're me. You're my branches. You're, 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 um, vehicles of extending me vehicles of extending me so that um, so that what touches people what 
quickens people is another, not, not the branch. You know, I was talking to a brother today on the phone, and, and uh, he was just saying, you know, he was blessed that I came, and he was saying, you know, you, you, you can come anytime, brother. And I said, well, you know, we know that it's not us. It's Christ. That's not a doctrine. It's Christ. We say that. Let's be humble. But we're not humble. We're proud because it, we know the depth of it's Christ. No, we don't. We know the, we know the good teaching of it. But it, the depth of it is the life and the, the nature and the manifestation of the one who was back there in Abraham's day and, and was back there in David's day and David looking in his face and writing psalms about him and, you know, all wrapped up in him and uh, David on the run from Saul trying to kill him and, and he's, with, he's with the Lord. He's, he's with the Lord. I mean, he's truly, truly with the Lord. And it's, it's powerful in his life. It's not, it's not, um, <clears throat> I mean, the Psalms don't sound like doctrinal teaching, do they? <laughs> they sound like a guy that's, his heart is with the Lord. His heart is with the Lord. So, um, and he said, Lord God, this is Abram speaking to the Lord. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said unto him, take me an heifer of three years old and a she goat of three years old and a ram of three years old and turtle dove and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these and divided them in the midst and laid each piece one against the other. But the ver birds divided he not, and when the fowls came down upon the carcass, on the carcasses, the fowls, the fowls representing, as, as Jesus described in Matthew 13 in the parable of the sower, the enemy comes to steal the word, the seed, the seed. Jesus, when he got ready to describe that, says the parable of the sower is this. Some seed fell by the wayside, and the devil, the enemy, came to steal the word of the kingdom. Wait a minute. We will, or we'll say the word of God, or we'll say all this. Yeah, it's the word. He's not trying to get the teaching out of you. It's a seed. The word of the kingdom is an actual seed. Abram knows all about the seed. He knows it. He knows that's what God promised. That's what is in Galatians, the, the faith of Abraham. And that's what um, it tells us that if we have this, you know, if you're Christ, then you are Abraham's seed because you've gotten the seed in you. He's been planted in you. So the, the attack isn't just trying to steal you, steal you from having time in the scriptures. He'll do that. He'll do that. He'll try to steal your time in the word. Um, he's not just trying to steal the message of Christ and him crucified out of you by like some method of like a, a Christ and I'm crucified magnet to pull out the words and teachings. That his attacks on the seed. It's always really on the seed. We're no threat. A, a branch apart from the vine is no threat at all. We're no threat. You know. So. So all this, all these offerings are laid forth and the fowls came down upon the carcasses and Abram drove them away he drove them away he, he saw it he realized 
I need to make a stand instead of questioning God. Well, when I, you know, you promised a seed and I have no seed. I mean, I, I understand that. I do. I understand questioning that. Lord, I'm seeking you with all my heart. Uh, I don't want teaching, Lord. I want your son actually formed in me, but where is he? And we get in circumstances, we get in things, and stuff comes out of that, that's, not, that's not the seed. Do you know how many of us in this room have experienced that within the last week? All of us. All of us. And our heart yearns. Not I, but Christ. Our heart yearns. He must increase and I must decrease. I understand Abram's words to God, but he was wrong to address God directly without it being through a, an altar. Because every bit of the journey up to this point was done through an altar. And Abram built an altar and called upon God. And Abram built an altar. And Abraham, you know, and Abram returned to the altar that he had built at the beginning. And, you know, and so God's saying, you, you want to do this right? We need to be on the right basis. We need to be on the altar basis. We need to be on the sacrifice basis. And when we say that, that's never going to happen in you or in me without the nature of the land. It'll never happen. It's him in us. So all of our fears of, you know, well, you know, what does that mean? Because that's really what Abraham's asking, isn't it? What does this mean? We're wanting to know, you know. And we all take it to ourselves, and we go, well, you know, since I love you, Jesus, I am willing to, you know, I mean, I remember when I first got saved, I was so, so blessed by receiving Christ that I was willing to give him my cigarettes, my marijuana, my acid. Yeah, and I did. I gave it to him. And he said, I don't want it. <laughs> I want your heart. <laughs> you know, but I felt like so spiritual I did so spiritual and I, ju I could just see him going oh thank you Randy like I got a stash bag right over here or something weird like that <clears throat> man he's, he's wanting the son he wants the son he wants his son he wants the firstborn son and he doesn't want a, a copy of the son and he doesn't want Abraham he doesn't want Abram to be talking directly to him without the crucified son, the altar, the sacrifice. Do you see, do you understand that? I mean, maybe we don't fully understand that yet. You know, it's like not one person came to Jesus without the altar, without looking to the altar where Jesus was slain. That's where it all all of it comes, but not just justification, but sanctification and everything else. And the altar is still valid today. So God's given Abram a, a, a visual lesson, as it were. Take this buzzard beater and beat these fowls off of the sacrifice. Meaning, the way that your mind is, you're letting all kind of stuff come in and fly around your head, fly within, you know, and distract you from, from just being, you know, I mean, I've said it so many times, but when Jesus said, no man comes to the Father but by me, he wasn't just saying, I'll take your hand and get you to the Father. He was on his way to Calvary. That's where, he, when he died, that's where entrance came to the Father. And, and rose again and <clears throat> so so there's there is this process our, our, our process is not to be the sacrifice except by Christ and that doesn't happen automatically 
And that sometimes takes a long time to get worked in, as it did to Abraham. Abraham, it took a long time. But we press towards the mark of the prize of the high calling. And so he, uh, the father is saying, you did well up to this point with all these altars. But when you moved off of the ground that you felt you were comfortable with me apart from Christ crucified, we need to go back to an altar and you need, this, you need to learn, you need to practice to beat this stuff that flies around in your head. I mean, not y'all's head, but you know. Well, maybe y'all's head. <laughs> All of our head. <clears throat> like the t-shirt Joseph got me. Y'all need Jesus. <laughs> so in verse um, 11, and when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. So we have, and it goes on saying, lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. So um, really, I would, I would say there's actually, instead of a double darkness, there's a triple right there. Because what you've got is the sun going down, a deep sleep, and then a horror of great darkness that fell upon him. So there's actually a, a triple darkness that is going on here. <clears throat> One of them, we could say when the sun goes down, it represents, okay, so we're, you know, just the evening has started and the night has started, but then the then you're falling into a sleep and you're doing it, we've discussed that, like, like at Adam bringing forth Eve. Um, you know, just a little side note. Um, Adam's death opened the way for a rib to come out of him. But that rib and that death all by itself was not enough. God had to make that rib into Eve. Adam didn't do that. Adam didn't do that. There was a, there has to be faith in the operation of God. You know? And then, because um, it's interesting because you know, he put him into a deep sleep, he opened his side, he took a rib out. But it all it sounds to me like he didn't just make her right there either. It sounds like he went off and then when he made her, he brought her to him. Okay. So, you know, we see the, the process a lot more simple than what it really is. And we see we see sort of Adam, you, you know, you did good, you laid down, you were wounded, she was taken out of you, but she, really she wasn't taken out of him. Ultimately, she was his wife. And she wasn't just a rib. She was from that rib made into a, the wife of the lamb or the bride or whatever words you want to use. And that's God's process. It's God's process. And what did Abram do? I don't know. Maybe he licked his wounds. Maybe he stayed in a deep sleep until he woke him up and said, here she is. I don't know. But I don't think, I mean, Adam and Eve, that's a shadow, right, of Christ and, and the bride. Well, Jesus didn't see his side open, a rib taken out, and then bingo, the bride is here. There was a work that had to be done. And in some ways that work is still being done so that she can be presented to him, right? Presented to him. <clears throat> Verse 13, and he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is 
that is not theirs. And um, that little verse right there, um, we're going to get a good taste of that starting, starting with the next chapter, which we should be in the next time I teach. We're going to get a good dose of what that is because it's not what, what you might assume. <clears throat> and, and shall serve them and shall afflict them for 400 years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. Okay? So that nation, they are going to serve them Abraham's seed. He didn't say Israel, but Abraham's seed is going to serve them and be afflicted by them, and that will go over a period of time of 400 years. And afterward, see, he moves on to say, And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward shall they come out with great substance. So that's, that's a big part of what we're going to be seeing soon. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, thou shalt be buried in a good old age, but in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. Verse 17 is, is important to the process, to, to the process, you know, 400 years from now or whenever. Um, two generations from us. It's important to the process. When the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites and the Kenizzites and the Cadmonites and the Hittites and the Parasites and the Rephraims and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Girgashites and the Jebusites. All right, so let's wrap this up with <clears throat> this process that happened here. Um, there's this darkness. There's this double darkness. No, there's this triple darkness that comes and in the midst now this is important uh, do you believe that you'll ever get into deep deep darkness at any time that you will not know how to handle this or that or whatever all kind of things that show up by our lack of light that that show up light, that show lack of light, that show up light, because in the midst of that, in the midst of that, he saw glorious light, in the midst of it, I don't want to go there, I'm afraid of that, I'm da 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 da, in the midst of that, you're going to see the right kind of light. You're going to see it. It's going to be for you like the dawning. But if if it was full bright day and then, this, as it were, another sun came up that was of the same consistency of ours or whatever, it would still be just bright day. But if you're, you remember the scriptures, uh, I, and Jesus said it, as a matter of fact. 
that was quoted from the Old Testament, they that sat in darkness saw a great light. Do y'all remember that one? Who gets to see the great light? They that sit in darkness. Don't fear the darkness, fear the lack of it. Don't fear the mourning, fear, you know, the comfort. Don't fear the being hungry, fear that you're not hungry. They that sat in darkness got to see a great, why was it great? Because it was so dark. So who would appreciate the light the most? Somebody who sees that light in the daytime or somebody who sees it in a, in, in a threefold darkness? And they're sitting there and they're going, wow, wow. And so, in a, in a certain sense, Abram was still in darkness because he had stuck with the altar for a certain period of time, but then he was getting familiar with the Father in his own mind, and he doesn't know that we come to the Father through the Son. And so he's in darkness and doesn't know it. He's in darkness and doesn't know it. And then that glorious light. No, 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 not the sun coming up. Not the sun coming up. The altar fire, that's what it says. The lamp passed through, passed through the sacrifice. That's why it came. The light didn't come because Abraham was in darkness. It came to light and to fire the altar in our heart. To light and to fire that altar inside of us. But you can talk about it in the daylight. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? What I'm saying? You can talk about it in the daylight. And it doesn't have hardly any effect compared to now I'm really in darkness and it's, you know, I don't know what to do. Da, da, da. You know, the, the devil showed up for the first time, you know, in a sense, the fowls of the air. And all of a sudden, from God comes a light. But the light is a fire. And it's not just any fire. It's not building a fire in the darkness. It is having built an altar in the darkness and God will show up with light if it's his son. You can be assured of it. See, but we have all these fears based on not knowing God yet, though. You know what I'm saying? If you know the Lord, then you go, well, you know, it's dark. But I'll find whatever sticks I can. Say, Lord, and here's, here's sacrifice. And, and then he'll go, yeah, you're lined up now. Now you're lining up, so now you're going to see. But what are you going to see? You know, oh, the campfire, like like Peter did when he was, you know, <laughs> no, no, wrong fire. It'll, you will see what God honors. You will see the the fire of God. You know, I mean, have you ever been in a youth youth group and and they talked about? You need the fire of God. Anybody ever heard that before? The fire of God? What does that mean? You know, more zeal. You know, more. You pumping yourself up. You know, banging on the thing. And yeah, everybody's you know so wired up from the music and everything that they could bite the back out of a pew or something like that, and they're just ah oh, yeah, it's Jesus, yeah. What happens to that fire? What happens to that zeal after a while? You gotta keep pumping them up. And you just keep, and we then we not just do it with that youth group, but we do it with all youth groups. And then we wonder why our young people, where are they? After, you know, after they get 
where are they? Where are these mammoth amounts of youth groups across America? This should be like a river flowing. Where are they? They got the wrong fire. And just to tell you, you don't want to get the wrong fire. <laughs> Nadab and Abihu, you may remember them. By the way, Nadab and Abihu were Aaron's two oldest sons. <laughs> it's like, I'm telling you, Aaron, I told you. You need to get these, these youth having the right fire, the altar fire, or the altar fire will come, but it won't fall on my, my Jesus. It'll fall on them. All right, I, th I think I thoroughly scared you now. God's light was the light of the altar. The light shed from the smoking furnace is now light in which you see. It, it was just a byproduct. Now you see in darkness. Well, what do you mean a byproduct? Hey, it's not God rushing to your aid, aid so that you can see. It is God bringing down so that we can see Christ crucified and now we see. We're not, I mean, if Abraham had a, the light, the fire came down and everything and then he's looking around and he goes, oh, Look at this, there's a tree over there I never saw, and oh, there's a frog hopping there, and da da da, now I can see. Then you're still blind. You're using God's light to help you see with your own eyes instead of seeing his, his son, instead of seeing Christ crucified, instead of seeing the Lamb of God. You are my branches. All of it very intimate if you if you see it, if you understand it. But it, you know, if you're going to a heart, you have to go to a heart, or you're just getting facts and stuff that says this stuff and it it sounds so good and everything, but then if it doesn't work, then something's wrong. Okay, well, we understand that it doesn't instantly work. He wants us, he wants to work it in us. He wants it worked within. <clears throat> Before it was as if you were blind, but did not know it. Because he was blind. He's talking to God and he's, he's confronting God over his son without an altar because it's not Christ and it's not the cross, it's Christ crucified. See, some people just preach Christ, a crossless Christ. Some preach the cross, but they don't put that it's Christ, that we were buried, you know, we were crucified in him and with him so they're just preaching like laying a cross on everybody when that really isn't the thing. It's Christ and him crucified. So it, it, was, it was as if he was blind, but he didn't know it. Then another reality is that he was blind to what God calls light. You know, because all Christians, light is a big deal, right? Light is a good, big subject. But what God calls light is the altar, altar light. When, when the light comes down and all of a sudden we're not just seeing what we put to death over here and what we opened and put down there and, you know, divided the parts and put them 
together and, and are, are going, no, oh, what a good, good person am I? That's still in there. It's not it till the fire hits it and the fire has to come from God. That's what's important. So um, that's why I wrote, uh, you were blind to what, what God calls light. now you're able to see Christ crucified clearly in the altar light of his death. Suddenly it is suddenly it is no longer a darkness, a horror of darkness like the scripture says. It's not. That's what we should pray for. We should pray that we soon see this God light, this light of God as it is understood in his heart, and then we won't be so afraid of the darkness or of the horror of the darkness. We will live with God there in that with joy and being one because the cross is where we were made one. Not, not when Jesus was teaching in a boat and people are standing on the shore. You know, He can talk about it all he wants, but one is only going to come through that altar. Amen? I mean, we got we, we to understand that. And that altar is his death, first and foremost. The Father shows the light of his Son, this is my Son. Also, you're able to see the Amorites that you've allowed to stay freely in the land that belongs to God. Because remember, Abram's in a land that God said was already mine. And he brought him in there and he brought Israel out of bondage. Not the firstborn, but Israel out of bondage, the firstborn out of the death of the land. He brought them out of bondage to go in and possess the land. But to get that, you can't do it without the firstborn. <laughs> you can't do it. You can't do it without the lamb. It's not possible. Um, remember it talked about the Amorites or you know, still there. You see that your friends are really God's enemies and you've joined to them. You also see that it's time to do something about it. It's time to go back into the land and drive them out of the caves of your heart. You know, that you've let them lurk around in there and given them food. Oh, here's some food, you know. Don't worry, we won't show up too much. Some of you are learning that they will. They'll show up all the time. They'll lie to you. Oh, we won't show up too much. Thank you. Just keep feeding us. Feed us. Feed us. Keep us alive. All we want to do is be alive. Surely the smell of death or whatever it was is past. Hmm? <coughs> So, so think about the three Hebrew children. Think about them. Remember what it said uh, uh, here in Genesis that it was a, um, verse 17, it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. We look at the fiery furnace and we only see it as a tool of the wicked king in which they're um, in captivity. But it occurred to me when I was reading this in Genesis that God calls this a furnace. I thought, you know what? That, that can be one or the other, depending on our approach. 
it can either be a fiery furnace that somebody's putting us through and we're, we don't deserve this and this isn't right and the king's stupid because he listened to those stupid advisors and you're supposed to be smarter than that. Or you could say, you know, the pastor's stupid because he listened to someone else and was influenced by them and that ain't right and, you know, this is all just, you know, flesh. <laughs> all the flesh um, it can it can be that or it can be the king really is trying to get you out of it but God is not going to allow it you remember the story don't you in Daniel the king got suckered by some of his counselors and he was continually trying to get the them out of the fiery furnace. Same with Daniel, you know. I mean, he was angry and then, you know, da 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 and then make the fire. But look at his response when he gets Daniel back, when he gets the three Hebrew children. He didn't go, he didn't go, well, y'all lucked out. He goes, these guys are, you know, because it, the, particularly in the fiery furnace, that's where one like the son of, of God is walking around with them. Well, that's us crucified with Christ. That's us in the fire. That's us put into the death with him, but raised also up with him. Or it's just a story about some fire, and some lions. I think that that's that was the whole point of that. Um, let's see where. Think about the three Hebrew children in the fiery furnace. It's only in the furnace that they see Jesus. How did they see him? What by what light? <laughs> it was by the fire. It was by the fire. The fire, you remember what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. This light affliction worketh for us a far more an exceeding weight of glory, but not just because God makes it that way. You have to, while we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. But the things which are seen are temporal. But the things which are not seen are eternal. Okay, well, what's, what's the difference? Okay, so I'm... Uh, I'm meditating on eternity, not temporal things. I'm meditating on eternity. You know what? The best people can, Christians can come up with to meditate on eternity, the things that are eternal, streets of gold, gates of pearl, and, you know, that kind. That, take that away and try to get them to meditate on things that are eternal. It's like, well, there's, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like, okay, give me a minute. <laughs> and, but what he's talking about and, and the beauty of what he's talking about there, I mean, it goes all the way back to chapter three, but it, but you can see it when in, what is it, verse seven, I guess, that, we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God. We are cast down, but not forsaken. We are, that's the next verse. This is, this is the beauty of it. You're being thrown in a fiery furnace where you can get the Lord. But if you don't see it, if you look at the same circumstances as temporal, it doesn't work for you. You're just griping and complaining and going, what's wrong? But if you you understand this, this is the fire of God. This is going to bring forth Christ. It's going to bring more of a light of the altar than I've ever seen before this time. It's, gonna, it's working for you a far more eternal weight of glory. While we don't look at it and go, you know, this is all stupid. Even the lions are stupid. You know, 
No. We are, I won't use the word stupid, we're ignorant of the reality You know, I, I honestly don't have words to express it. I mean, it, because I realize that a lot of times when I say certain things, then we go, oh, it's that. No, it's not what I said. Hopefully, I said that from something I've seen. But you have to see what I've seen. Or, let me qualify that. God bless you to see way more than I've seen. But my heart wants to see Jesus. And if your heart does, you will see him apart from whatever I've seen. So I said, what light? It was the light of the fiery furnace which they had turned into an altar with altar fire. They turned the temporal into an altar with altar fire and God now, the fire has turned into fire from God uh, in their understanding. And Jesus is right there in, in the sacrifice, in the altar, in the place of death. He's right there with them. Now, that's what I was saying with, with Abraham. And I was saying, you know, if you, wanna, if you want to get God there, he... He's interested in his son, his firstborn son, the one that gave himself and will give himself. And if you'll make an altar, the Father will bring the light. He'll bring the fire, which is the light. Their great area of boasting before this was their own righteousness. You remember the... Three Hebrew children. The, the head guy came over and said, okay, well, you're only going to be allowed to eat these kind of foods. And so they said, well, look, let us eat what we, we eat, and if we, uh, if we don't look better than everyone else who's eating the good stuff, <laughs> then, you know, so they do it, and the guy comes back, and he says, well, you're the rosiest, best-looking, red-cheeked, you know. Your, your hair is gorgeous. <laughs> well, that, there's no mention of Christ in that. There's no mention of an altar. That was their own righteousness that they were boasting in. There's no beauty of the altar. There's just the beauty of these three good-looking guys. Ah, girls back off. They're taken. <clears throat> but now, because they see him, the judgment fire has become the fire of illuminating him. It was judgment fire. It was judgment fire. From the king's perspective from the guy who went over and said, you need to bow down, you know, um, and you didn't, so this is judgment. And, you, and we can walk into that thing and we're walking into it and going, well, this ain't right and this is wrong judgment and, you know, we're all wrapped up in the earth, we're all wrapped up in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and we just are not with him in the things that are eternal. So, but they, they were able to turn those into altar fires instead of judgment fires. I wrote, the red hot furnace has become the light of, his, of life. I mean, it's become the light of life. Now they're not going to die. Now they're not going to Wait a minute, you, are you saying the altar fire is the light of life? Yes. <clears throat> uh, speaking of the three, three Hebrew children, they were, they were good people. 
They were God's people, right? Uh, they were devout. But they knew almost nothing concerning the man in the fire, Christ crucified. They didn't know anything about the man in the fire, except the man was in the fire. And he wouldn't notice Jesus didn't save him from the fire. He was in there with them. He took them down into his death so that he could raise them up out of that death. Christ crucified is first a furnace of destruction and then becomes a flaming torch by which men may see him. <clears throat> I think somewhere along in, in these sharings, I really get into this, uh, the concept uh, here. It could be in another class, though, but <laughs> I'll get into it. I don't know. Okay. All right. That's it. We got through 15. Are you glad? <laughs> you should be.